This is Charlotte Talks. I'm Mike Collins. For years, Charlotte's Arts and Science Council provided much-needed funding for our city's key arts groups, smaller up-and-coming organizations, and individual artists. The money they distributed came from a fundraising model that was among the most successful in the country. But now, that model is broken, and when the ASC suggested last fall that voters say yes to an increase in the sales tax to support the arts, parks, and education, voters said no, and they said no despite dire warnings that doing so would jeopardize the arts community here. Those warnings were real, and in recent weeks, the ASC has gone to the county commission asking for $5 million in funding, and they plan to request $7 million from the city. The combined total, if granted, $12 million, would equal half the amount the sales tax hike would have brought in. So just how bad is this situation and how high are the stakes? Indeed, what is at stake? We dig into that this hour with Jeep Bryant, the president of the Arts and Science Council. And as we go through the hour, we'll meet others in Charlotte's arts community with a keen understanding of what underfunding can mean to artists and to the city and what proper funding can mean as well. Jeep Bryant, welcome to the program. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. Full disclosure, Jeep and I have known each other forever. We used to work at WBTV together. And we used to work out at the gym together. You went to New York. You worked for the Tony Awards. Now you're here. Why? <laughs> You know, you know, Mike, I, I came back for many of the reasons you just <laughs> teed up in the introduction. You have this notion that we are a community that over the years uh, has been very generous in its support of arts, science, history. Uh, back in the 90s, and I will date myself a little bit, I had the opportunity to serve on the board of the North Carolina Dance Theater, now Charlotte Ballet. Mm -hmm. Soon after that organization decided to move from Winston-Salem to Charlotte because of what was happening in Charlotte and really wanting to be part of the growth of the arts and cultural uh, community here. Um, also had the opportunity to participate in many of the fundraising drives that raised uh, a lot of money for the Arts and Science Council. So after a long time away and thinking about coming back home, you know, for me, it was a question of what area of Charlotte-Mecklenburg uh, is at a uh, challenging point where my work could make a difference. Um, it's clearly, it was clear from day one that uh, it's challenging. I also hope long term it's going to be rewarding because of the conversations we're having now about the need to invest more. So that was going to be one of my questions because you were working for the Broadway League, which are, are, among other things uh, produces the Tony Awards, which are the Broadway Oscars and Emmys. And, um, did you know before you took the job, just how dire the situation was here? And if so, why did you take the job? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I did. I had the opportunity to spend a lot of time, not only with the Board of Directors of the Arts and Science Council, but many of the organizations that are funded uh, by ASC. Also spent a lot of time uh, with the staff. And it, it was clear to me that there would be uh, path A and path B. Mm -hmm. You know, path A was, you know, the focus on the referendum through the fall, and then we also knew that path B would be, if not successful, what kind of a private-public partnership can we put together to, to increase investment in arts and culture and, and meet the aspirations that, that we've talked about that are so important in terms of future investment? The old model, which was workplace giving, we knew uh, anecdotally, I think all of us knew, uh, in, in who are peripherally involved in the arts community and who talk about this on the radio for a living, um, that it wasn't working anymore. But this announcement that dire consequences were about to befall us uh, kind of happened like that. Uh, but you've been actually spending from your reserves for a couple of years to keep the funding levels where they were, and now that's become un unsustainable, correct? That's correct. It was the accumulated earnings of the endowments at the Arts and Science Council that enabled the organization over the past two years to maintain that level of funding. But if we look historically, you know, the grants last year were $7 million. If we look back 10, 11 years ago, it was $12 million. So we are below the investment we used to make yeah. uh, at the Arts and Science Council. And it's, that gap really speaks to a number of ways that we see opportunities to invest more in the community. Back when the Arts and Science Council was granting $12 million, all of that money was going to a relatively small number of organizations. The, we have recognized that not only do we need to stabilize and sustain 
or that core of cultural organizations that have, have put Charlotte on the map from a art, science, history perspective. But we're also being called upon by the community to really have a true commitment to, to equity, to be thinking about the way we invest money, even when times are tight and when resources are constrained, in a way that also reaches into neighborhoods, supports individual artists and other uh, individuals, and also we're, we need to work more closely with Charlotte Mecklenburg Schools to improve the impact that we have uh, on education in the community. We're doing that in a small way now, and we see the potential to expand that. That was part of the request that we made of uh, the county commission. So did the realization that you need to expand beyond the key arts groups, and I'm, I'm assuming when you say key arts groups, you're talking about the symphony and the opera and the ballet and actors theater and children's theater and a couple of other smaller organizations, that realization that you need to broaden your uh, uh, donation pool to uh, other smaller groups and artists came at the same time that the need for money began to rise because the giving was down? The, yeah, I think a key turning point here in this community was the Cultural Life Task Force and the Cultural Vision Plan that was created in 2014. That was really the community process that challenged the entire arts and cultural sector to be thinking more broadly ab about investments in the community. But Mike, I would also say, you know, we look for best practices around the country. We are seeing, in community after community, a recognition that the funding for arts, for science history, really does need to uh, reach into every neighborhood, every community. I talked about my involvement with North Carolina Dance Theater. As a kid, I had the chance to be on the stage at Children's Theater and productions at Theater Charlotte later was in a production of Davidson Community Players. And I look back and realize that my experience was supported by the cultural organizations, the Arts and Science Council at that time. But I also recognize in talking with both individuals who have been here for a long time and also those who are new to the community that we're not giving the chance that I had as a kid. We're not giving that to every, every child in Mecklenburg County. That's, that's a call to action for the Arts and Science Council. It's also a, a call to action for the organizations we support. And they want to embrace that challenge, but it does require resources. So let me get to some nuts and bolts very quickly. These don't require long answers. Uh, at the apex of your success, of the ASC's success at fundraising, how much money were you bringing in? How much money were you sending out to organizations? How many organizations and individuals did you support at the apex of it when it was really going gangbusters? I know the, the, the largest uh, campaign for the community raised uh, $12 million. Um, I don't know the exact number of organizations that were supported then, but it was far lower than the 33 that we, we support today. And today, right now, how much money are you, how, like last year, how much money did you bring? How much money do you think you'll be bringing in this year without the help of the county commission and the city council? If for, the, for the operating grants that we provide to organizations large, medium, and small, we've received 3.2 million from the city. That down down from 12. Oh, I'm sorry, keep going, keep going. Three, three point, yeah, 3.2 from the city. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we, we augmented that with substantial contributions from the, from the ASC endowments. We were, also, we were also able to raise last year close to $3 million from the private sector. That was a combination of workplace giving, individual donations, business and foundation gifts total as well. Of. So that, that was a total of about, uh, about $8 million that we- So you're $4 that million dollars short from the apex and you were using some of your re reserves to get to that level. Correct. Right. Uh, what happened? Why doesn't the workplace giving model work anymore? One key reason is that companies have now want to give employees a wide range of choices. Back when I was raising money for the ASC in the 1990s, there were two asks of employees, the Arts and Science Campaign and also the United Way Campaign. Now more and more companies, while giving employees the option to contribute to those two organizations, are also matching gifts to any 501c3 uh, organization. So it's really open, open architecture in terms of employee giving. Is this a difficult sell now that uh, we're, we're trying to do a different thing uh, and, and, and the word arts has been tagged with the word elite? Arts are, for the, are a, an elite endeavor for people who are highfalutin. That's part of the problem, I think. Uh, it, but, and it doesn't make any sense to me, because anybody who listens to music on the radio or buys music off of iTunes, anybody who looks at a billboard, anybody who watches a movie, anybody who goes and, and, and sits down in front of their TV, they're all participating in consuming the arts. Why don't they understand? Why the disconnect? 
I think a, a, an opportunity for us and for the organizations we support is instead of elite, it's really about relevance and access. If we think of the Charlotte Symphony as an elite organization, I really wish residents could have been at one of the recent performances. There were a couple of pieces that were traditional classic music pieces that were beautifully played, but the heart of the recent Charlotte Symphony concert at the Blumenthal was a brand new piece of work created about the experience of native North Carolinians, mm -hmm. the Cherokees. Uh, it was presented by young Cherokee descendants who used a combination of spoken word, singing, and the orchestra to really remind us of what was the experience for those who have been in North Carolina the longest. It was a powerful experience for the audience, and when it was over, the entire Belk Theater stood up in this ovation to applaud. That, that's, the reason that happened is the Charlotte Symphony is looking for opportunities to extend its reach, to, to engage a diverse community. The Arts and Science Council now for several years has been examining grant applications with a cultural equity lens, looking at the grants we make to organizations of all sizes and asking the question, how are you thinking about how the audience in Charlotte-Mecklenburg is changing. What is your plan for community outreach? How are you engaged from an education standpoint? So I think that perception is really based on individuals who aren't engaging uh, as we hope they would and are not having those kinds of experiences, you know, whether it's uh, uptown or out in the neighborhoods where we, where we produce culture blocks programming for free. There are so many ways now in Mecklenburg County to experience uh, and to experience art in a way that uh, isn't uh, elite but is relevant and really is is designed for the population we have today. This disconnect of, of arts being elitist and yet people consuming art almost hourly in their lives in some way uh, is not a local phenomenon. It's a national phenomenon. Do you think it was at all exacerbated in terms of people's putting their money where their uh, eyes go. Uh, do you think it was at all exacerbated by the ASC itself? Because it, became, it was a workplace giving thing. Uh, and you weren't giving to your favorite, maybe you have a favorite arts organization, maybe you patronize Actors Theater all the time. But you never gave them any money because you gave it the office. You gave it to the ASC and they decided. Well, do you think that exacerbated the disconnect? It removed people from the arts groups that they consume and love. You know, Mike, we actually went out into the community and asked the question of residents. You know, when you think about the Arts and Science Council, what is your perception? And overwhelmingly, I think because the Arts and Science Council has been supporting organizations for such a long time, the, the perception of ASC that came back to that research, research was very positive based on the investments we've made. Having said that, we're going to be hearing from uh, Anna uh, soon, one of the artists that, who's been a partner with the Arts and Science Council. Just a few years ago, we did not have any grant programs that were available yeah. to individual artists. So, so there have been significant changes in recent years. Uh, the ripple effect of that has not been as great as we want to see longer term, mainly because the, we've been investing in those new areas at the same time the budget's been contracting. Okay. So we see the potential of, again, addressing perceptions and the way people experience the work we do to have a much uh, greater impact, but it will require success in our fundraising efforts. We've already got a couple of emails from people who want to chime in on this topic, so if you'd like to join our conversation, you can do that through email at charlottetalks at wfae.org. You can search for WFAE on Facebook or get to us through Twitter at Charlotte Talks, as you alluded to a moment ago. We will meet in a moment or two. Uh, some people who are uh, recipients of the largesse of the Arts and Science Council and, and talk about what they're contributing to the marketplace and how uh, their need is with regard to you when we come back. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and Northeastern University, presenting Women Who Empower Mind and Body, featuring Angela Yoakum of Novant Health and Dr. Holly Jimison of Northeastern, Wednesday, February 26th, northeastern.edu slash Charlotte. And the Whitewater Center, dedicated to the active outdoor lifestyle, providing year-round access to over 50 miles of trails across 1,300 acres. More at usnwc.org. In 1898, 30 years after the Civil War, African Americans in Wilmington were getting ahead and white supremacists didn't like it. Tensions flared, at least 60 black men died, and it was labeled for years as a race riot 
Some people believed that for years, but now Pulitzer Prize-winning journalist David Zucchino has uncovered an uglier truth. It was, in fact, the violent overthrow of the town's duly elected multiracial government. He shares more of the story with us tomorrow at 9. Tatiana Fazlalizadeh uses art to wage war against street harassment. Her Stop Telling Women to Smile posters were first seen in Brooklyn, and now they can be seen across the country. Art, activism, and a new attitude, the ongoing fight to make America's streets safer. I'm Todd Zwillick, Tatiana Fazlalizadeh. That's next time on 1A. 1A, coming up from 10 to noon after Charlotte Talks on 90.7 WFAE, Charlotte's NPR News source. It's Charlotte Talks on Listener Funded, 90.7 WFAE and 90.3 WFAG. I'm Mike Collins. We're here with Jeep Bryant, who's the president of the Arts and Science Council. As you probably know, if you listen regularly and have been following the news, they came to you in November and asked for a quarter cent sales tax hike to support the arts, parks, and education, and voters said no. Prior to the vote, they said, if this doesn't pass, we have to go to Plan B, and we're not exactly sure what that is and whether we can fund arts organizations to the level that they have been been accustomed to, and the, and the chickens have come home to roost, essentially. That's where we are. You worked in media, Jeep. You've worked in banking. Uh, your last job, as I said, was with the Broadway League, who produces the Tonys. And you have a lot of experience in, in the theater world. What do you think is the most serious misconception people have about arts, particularly people who have the money, for instance, to go to the Broadway series here with, at the Belk? or go to, to Broadway and plunk down $300 for a ticket in the, in the third balcony for uh, Hamilton. Uh, what, what do you think is the, most mis the biggest misconception about that? That $300, that should pay for the show, right? But it doesn't. That's correct. And I would think for so many organizations, you know, I'm particularly thinking of uh, the wonderful museums that we have here in Charlotte Mecklenburg. People think if I'm buying a ticket, I'm supporting the organization. And, and because there are a lot of people here at an opening, uh, this is an organization that should be doing quite well. So you, ticket revenue is just one, one component uh, of the budget. So I do think that's, that's one, probably one uh, misconception people, uh, people have. Is it true across the board? I know it's true in theater that the ticket sales, the fill the seats does not pay for the production. Is it true with the opera? Is it true with uh, the symphony? Is it true with the dance company? That's correct. That's correct. It takes a combination of ticket revenue, donations from individuals, sponsorships, and we're seeing that's where a lot of the corporate support in Charlotte is going to support specific exhibitions. Um, and, and it also, over the years, has had a strong all of the organizations have benefited from a strong commitment by the Arts and Science Council for operating support to really cover those expenses in the budget that are hard to get individual donors uh, to support. We live uh, in an increasingly wholesale world, and, and stores across the country and malls across the country are suffering from this because we're all shopping on Amazon and other Internet outlets where we can get almost a wholesale price and we have it delivered to us. If I'm going to support the arts... Why don't I just support the arts group that I like directly? Why go through a middleman? Why have a middleman? I think if we were stepping forward as a community, uh, all of us who care about art, science, and history actually would be doing both. The reason I think both are important, I think direct contributions to organizations do give you that opportunity to support the work personally. We're going to be, I know, talking with uh, Chip Decker from Actors Theater about the work they've done from a uh, fundraising perspective just recently. But I think the, I, well, what I know is the benefit of contributing to the Arts and Science Council is we have in place panel reviews that involve experts from around the country who come in to look at uh, our organizations, their requests for funding against best practices in the country. For the grants that we make for small community projects, we involve not only board members from the ASC, but also community members to serve on those panels. So you can trust when you're making a donation that the, the dollars are being carefully vetted in terms of where they go to have the greatest impact. I also think you, know, so you can support one organization directly. There's value when you think about the contributions to the ASC and saying, you know, I also want to make sure that organizations that go beyond those that I am directly involved with that are serving young people in the community, serving new communities, are also getting uh, strong support. Let me share some of the things that have come in while we've been talking. Jarrett on Twitter says, while I understand the skepticism, unfortunately the arts and science sector of the Charlotte region is quite paltry compared to other metro regions I've lived in. We do 
for a fact, need a strong a ASC for a strong arts science sector for Charlotte. Paul emails, if the city can afford millions to hundreds of millions of dollars for a commercial enterprise, the Panthers, a few million for ASC shouldn't be a problem. Tony on Twitter, no. <laughs> ASC Charlotte had their chance. They made their case. Taxpayers had our say. If the model is broken, fix it, but without public funds. In a city with more pressing needs, public arts funding, unfortunately, should have a lower priority than housing, schools, etc. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, another listener, Caroline, was so involved in this. She she sent this email yesterday, and she identifies herself as a lover and supporter of the arts who said no to the sales tax referendum. And she wants to know, and I kind of asked this question, but I'll ask it through her words, why the ASC has a staff of 30-plus people? Why can't they do more with less? If you look at their staff roster, they seem to have duplication of roles and positions. And she also asks, why do we need the ASC at all? Let people give directly to the organizations they want to support and eliminate the bloated overhead of an umbrella agency. That's a twofold question. I think the first one is, why do you have a staff of 30 plus? Do you? Yes, we do, Mike. We have uh, uh, 31 individuals. That's down. We recently reduced the budget by 15%. We, we reduced, we eliminated some leadership positions at the Arts and Science Council. We also uh, eliminated positions both in communication uh, and finance. And what will I that said, do to you? Uh, uh, what will that, that do to that, you? That, that, that lowers the salary budget by 15%. And I said at the time that our budget beginning July 1 of this new year is going to be completely contingent on which programs and uh, grant initiatives are we supporting. And, and I think it is helpful just to describe what those individuals do. Mm -hmm. I'll try to do this quickly, but because these are small units that are attached to specific initiatives. We have five people who support public art projects for both the city and the county. They're, they're managing 45 projects right now, 10 million in terms of multi-year public art projects. We have two people that run the Culture Blocks program with Mecklenburg County. They're working with 45 different providers, 70 programs over the past six months. We have just three people who manage all of the other grant programs that we do, the 33 operating grant recipients, the, the program for artists, cultural vision grants. So I can tick down through the staff, not to say that all of those positions are permanent, because they're not. You know, we'll have to build the budget next year, really starting from zero and say, okay, what funding is coming in to support which initiatives, and let's make sure we staff efficiently for that. You have done some personnel downsizing. You've moved your uh, headquarters from, I think, what were probably relatively expensive digs, although I'm sure you got some help on the rent in those locations. But you're now in a WeWork space. Uh, but Commissioner Vilma Leak asked you directly for your salary. And, and the answer that you gave her was $220,000 a year. And at one point, Robert Bush, the, your predecessor, uh, had at least four people on staff earning well into six figures. What's the, organization, what's the organization's total overhead for salaries? So two of those positions were among those that I just mentioned uh, have, have been eliminated. So our, our overhead, our general administration overhead is 8%. We also have 8% in fundraising expenses. Mm -hmm. And when we contract, say, with Mecklenburg County to deliver a program like Culture Blocks, there's, it's 15% to support the community workshops that we do, the meetings with residents. So, it's, it's, so it, it varies based on the program. So this is a rude, impertinent question that I'm going to ask anyway, and I'm sorry for it, because uh, I don't begrudge anybody making as much money as they possibly can. This is America, for crying out loud. But when you have people in the arts sector administrating uh, or administering this arts collection and distribution organization and they are making well into six figures each and the people that they are supporting can't even imagine that kind of money uh, how does that sit why should that be the the salary for the president's position is set by the board of directors, obviously, and that's and always the excuse. Well, anybody no, in not any an excuse, sector, I didn't set my salary; it was set by the board of directors. Why does the board of directors have that kind of an outlook that we need to pay all these six-figure salaries and we need to give out this money that we're collecting to artists who are making subsistence-level livings? Wait, and I just said we're, we're not paying lots of six-figure salaries, but uh, so the, the, it was. It involved a national recruiting firm looking across the country, and so I, obviously the board would have to address that. And I assume it will be addressed over time. You know, the point I just made about next year's budget, 
you know, we're starting from scratch. You know, and, you know, my position and everything you know, need to be evaluated through the lens of what are, what are the resources that we have Clearly, we have a model right now that is not sustainable, and so we, we will need to make changes. What, what do you think the voters, when they said no to the arts referendum, uh, the sales tax referendum, what were they saying? Because there's a, not only was the, was the campaign to get people to vote sending, I think, mixed messages, I think we got a mixed message back from the voters. How did you interpret the no vote? You know, I actually had the chance to talk to a lot of voters at the polls who told me I'm voting no, and so I had the opportunity to say why. I was at most of the early voting locations and spent election day uh, at the polls. There were three reasons I remember being predominant uh, went for, among voters who said they were voting against it. Number one, the regressive nature of a sales tax impacting low-income residents more, more than others. Mm -hmm. Secondly, the fact that while the county commission had voted on an allocation, it could not be guaranteed in perpetuity. The concern that what happens 18 months from now, if I'm voting for increased investments in arts, culture, parks, greenways, education, because I care about those areas, what happens if, if things change? That was number two. The third reason I heard, and we also saw this in editorial commentary and other places, was we have large budgets for both the city and county. We go through an annual process of thinking about priorities. How do we allocate limited resources to serve the needs of the entire community? Shouldn't that budget process be the place where we debate, we prioritize, and make sound decisions about where, where we want to invest? That's why we're engaged in those conversations now, because <clears throat> clearly that was a key, a key message coming out of the referendum was, if not the sales tax, can't this be weighed against other community priorities? Cheryl emails, I recently moved to Charlotte from Durham so that I could be closer to my family. I watched Durham completely transform itself by focusing on the arts, the new Durham Performing Arts Center, as well as all of the art galleries, studios, and free art spaces brought so many visitors to Durham that new hotels followed. The downtown area is completely different now, and Durham is a go-to place for entertainment in music, art, dance, theater, and comedy. I missed that vibe here in Charlotte. All of the money that we have spent on arts and arts programming, all the money that we have plowed into some of the finest uh, physical plants for the arts to be presented, from the children's theater to the Belk, uh, to the Knight Theater, and, and to the old home at, at, at Actors Theater, has it paid off? Has it paid off, or are we behind the eight ball on this? You know, one of the areas that we are discussing in the Mecklenburg County budget proposal that we put forward is significantly increasing the money allocated to what we call cultural vision grants. And those are grants that are designed to look at innovative opportunities to reach into new communities, uh, bridge across differences, and create the experiences that that, that uh, email is speaking to. I, I, I believe we can and should expand the direct funding that we, we provide uh, in those areas. So let's turn our attention or our focus to, uh, on how the lack of funds has been affecting the folks who depend on you for funding. Those organizations include the Biggies, of course, the Charlotte Symphony, the Charlotte Ballet, Opera Carolina, and Children's Theater. But then there are other smaller organizations and individual artists, too. Hannah Hassan is one of those artists. She is the spoken word poet, writer, storyteller, who has been commissioned to write and perform in cities across the country, including this one, Chicago, Washington, uh, Philadelphia, and others. And she's with us in our Spirit Square studio right now. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, and Chip Decker is executive director of the Actors Theater of Charlotte, which despite a major shortfall, which we will talk about uh, in a few minutes, just announced their 32nd season. Welcome back. Thank you, Mike. Good to be here. You're welcome. Uh, how, how dependent, Hannah, have you been either here or in other places that you work on public funding to, to bring in enough money to sustain you and your work? Yeah, very. Um, access to, to grant programs and fellowships and things of that nature make work that I do and other artists like me um, possible. Um, it gives us space to know that our community supports and believes in us. Um, and it gives us space to create from a place of not just personal creation, but from like 
how can we enrich the community that we live in? Mm -hmm. So that funding is really important. It's everything. So let me get into your head, because a lot of people, most people listening, work nine to five sure. at traditional jobs. Mm -hmm. And they, they look at you and think, my God, it's hand to mouth. It's like she'll, she'll get a grant and she'll do her thing. Uh -huh. And then the grant money is gone. And then she's got to look for another grant to do her thing. And what happens in the, in the interim? So why is it that you do what you do? You could find an easier way <laughs> to make a living. Well, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had traditional jobs before um, in both corporate and nonprofit spaces. Um, I do what I do because it's what I'm supposed to be doing. And I know that's a very artisty answer, but <laughs> I am following what I believe to be my purpose. And the work that I do, I, I've seen it um, change things and change me and change other people and create conversation um, in our community here in Charlotte that I believe can really elevate us and help us move forward in ways that we need to. So I, I do what I do because I don't feel like I have another choice. Uh, you run Actors Theater, Chip, and I think uh, I'm right about this. You can correct me if I'm wrong. You're, it's the only professional theater in town at the moment, correct? Uh, you correct, other than uh, Children's Theater. Well, Children's Theater, but, yes. you, but you pay your actors. Correct. Something. Not a lot, but you pay them. Um, as, as somebody who produced theater, and you've been producing theater here for at least 20, 24, 25 years now. Yes. Uh, first as a nomadic company you made <laughs> here at Spirit Square, moving <laughs> around. Camels. And finally, uh, you, you moved into your own space on Stonewall, uh, became a victim of gentrification. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> <laughs> Found a space elsewhere that didn't work out after you put a lot of money into it and... and um, and now you found a space at, at Queen's University. This has got to be hard. <laughs> That's the best way I can put it. And, and we know that you've had sellout crowds for a lot of your shows over the years. But even that is not enough to meet your needs. Why keep beating your head against this wall? Um Jeep hit it and Hannah hit it. It's conversations, Mike, and that's what the art that we do is, is creating conversations. And I firmly believe that, uh, you know, Twitter Tom who said no, I, I think the point is we do the art to have the conversations. And when we have the conversations, we become a better community. It's pretty simple. Theater was the original conversation. As soon as we learned to talk, we started telling stories, and then we knew who our neighbors were. It, without the arts, we don't know our neighbors, and we're not going to have meaningful, constructive conversations. And that's why I do it, because Charlotte desperately needs, as the 2016 Keith Lamont issue brought up, we need conversations. Uh, from Twitter Tom that you referenced a moment to email Michael. He says, lack of community support, lack of community support is a long time coming, even from the 80s and 90s. As a former chairman of the Board of Innovative Theater of Charlotte, I voted no on the sales tax. I perceive ASC boards as hapless bureaucrats. Has that been your experience? And I know you're sitting been, right next to the guys. I in the know, front of right? <laughs> um, I don't really want to focus on the past. I think right. it's the future, and I think our, our, we need to look at the future as far as our funding models go. Um, we are reaching out one on one to our constituency and our people, and we're spreading our message. And I think that's what's important right now. Um, it's it's <clears throat> again. We've been lacking that, that we haven't had conversations. And that's why we're doing our initiative, 100 Conversations for 100 Days, to get back in touch with our core constituency and, and, and let them know that their support means everything to us. Chip Decker is the executive director of the Actors Theater of Charlotte. Hannah Hassan is a local writer, spoken word artist, who we'll talk with more in a moment. And Jeep Bryant is the uh, uh, president of the Arts and Science Council. We're coming right back at Charlotte Talks on WFAE. Support for Charlotte Talks comes from WFAE members and NC Works with a commitment to helping businesses grow their workforce by offering services from talent recruiting to pipeline development. Details at next.ncworks.gov. Coming up 20 minutes from now on 1A, an update as deliberations begin in Harvey Weinstein's trial or Weinstein's trial and then artist Tatiana Falalizade. At one point in her career, she was known for her work with oil paintings, but after she branched out into public art, she began to believe that it could be a powerful tool to reduce harassment in the street. She began working on an art series entitled Stop Telling Women to Smile. That was back in 2012. And she will join Todd Zwillick 
on 1A to discuss all that and more in just a few minutes. We will continue our conversation about the state of the arts in just a moment. Hey y'all, this is Tommy Tomlinson. On this week's episode of Southbound, we talked to photographer Burke Uzzel, who has shot many iconic American photos, including the album cover of the soundtrack to the movie Woodstock. You can find this in every episode of Southbound on Apple Podcasts, NPR One, and WFAE.org. Support for Southbound comes from Southeast Radiation Oncology Group. It's Charlotte Talks on WFAE and WFHE. I'm Mike Collins. We're talking about arts and arts funding. Uh, Jeep Bryant is the president of the Arts and Science Council, which for years in this city has been the preeminent fundraiser for the arts and one of the most successful campaigns in the country. Things have changed, however, and now and the, the picture isn't so rosy. Hannah Hassan is with us. She's a local spoken word artist whose work has been produced in other cities as well. Uh, and uh, Chip Decker is executive director of the Actors Theater of Charlotte. How dependent are you, Hannah, Hannah on, on, um, on organizations like the ASC? Yeah, very. Um, not just for, like, funding for programming, but for things like professional development. So when you're an independent artist like myself, like I'm not going to a regular nine to five every day and getting training and um, up to, you know, learning more about my craft and things of that nature, unless I have access to things like some of the um, programming that I've had access to through Arts and Science Council. And I want to talk specifically about what you do in the community, because yeah. that addresses at least one of the concerns that one of the county commissioners brought up uh, <laughs> at that meeting that they had with Jeep. Uh, how, how dependent is Actors Theater? How much money do you get? How much, what would the loss of that money or cutting that money in half do to your organization? So we get about 5% of our annual budget through the ASC. So um, it, it's, it's a bit, and it's important to us. Uh, we have another, n a number of other revenue sources, um, and they're all very important. Uh, our situation was more of a perfect storm. We, that, whole, that whole jumping around in that 2016 thing, and we lost Stonewall, and then we lost the other space, and then we lost the third space. Uh, it just became uh, a cumulative disaster for us financially, only because uh, I think Jeep hit it. It was reserves. We yeah, went I, through our reserves. Yeah, I want to, for people who are not familiar with your story, you have always been in the black. Uh, you're, you don't operate in the red, which I think is highly responsible. And, and you essentially said, we are out of money, and if we don't get this money, we're going to shut down because we're not going into the red. Correct. The, you asked, you sent out a letter a couple of weeks ago, an email blast to people who, anybody who's ever put their, their rear in a seat, at Actors Theater got this letter saying, we need your help. We're 71,000. We need 71,000. We need, how much did you say you needed? Uh, our, our large nut is 200,000. Okay. You need that money. And if you don't get that money, you're done. Almost overnight, people andied up to the tune of almost $72,000, $35,000 of which I understand goes to buy the rights for the shows you're going to plan to produce next season. That's another thing that people don't understand. You don't just to pick a play off the shelf and do it. you got to pay for the rights for that. So that means that you've got $37,000 left over, and you still need, what, 100 and some more. Right. Let me just uh, clarify. So um, it's our reserve account, okay. the, the account, because theater is so front-loaded. We have to pay so much in advance. Right. So we had that reserve account built up at Stonewall Street, when we lost that, we started moving. And so moving around, renting venues, renting spaces, we started to dip into our reserve account. So every year that we were on the road, which is four, our reserve went down. So what we're trying to do is replenish that reserve. Without that operating reserve, I did not have funds to right. get the rights for season 32. I'm sure it was gratifying that so much money came in so It quickly. was amazing. But uh, did it surprise you that it came in that fast? I'm phenomenally surprised. I am humbled every day. We just, I heard from my general manager yesterday we have hit the halfway mark so we're at just about a hundred thousand dollars in uh we have a hundred thousand dollars to more to go 
Um, the appeal has been amazing. The response has been amazing. And again, I feel that it's just about its conversations and being transparent with our audiences. And Actors Theater is not alone. The symphony is always in need of money. Uh, Opera Carolina laid off their executive director because of a lack of funds in the last month or so. Uh, we, I'm sure other theater companies are also operating, they're all operating on a shoestring, but they're all uh, on the on the razor's edge here, when Actors Theater is able to erase $71,000 in two days, uh, that means there's money out there, but does that mean that's money not coming to you at the ASC? Or is there enough to support things like the need that Actors Theater and other groups face and the arts and science guys? Right, you know, the, it, it, it requires both. You know, for these budgets uh, that these organizations are managing, it takes both a combination of the direct individual contributions and support from the ASC. The reason the situation has been exacerbated in recent years is it was three years ago that the Arts and Science Council had to reset the level of grants going out to the organizations that it support. Dramatic cuts at that time and we were talking earlier about the reliance on the endowment to keep the level of funding flat, but albeit now at a level below what the uh, what the, the grant pool from just three years ago. So that's part of the combination of factors that the organizations are facing now. You know, going forward, it, it, we would be 10% of, of a uh, organization's budget with appropriate funding and after going through the panel process with some smaller organizations we could be 15 to 20, but that suggests there is still a great need for both earned and contributed revenue uh, for all of the all of the areas of a budget that the ASC doesn't provide direct so support. So one of the things that Mecklenburg County Commissioner uh, Vilma Leek was expressed disappointment in at that meeting that you were in the hot seat for was what she perceived to be a lack of money being given to arts groups and individuals that take their work into underserved communities. And I know, uh, Hannah, that you also believe mm -hmm. that uh, taking arts into those neighborhoods is of the utmost importance. That's, in fact, what you do. Yeah. Are we doing that enough? Is Vilma not, is just not aware of what you do mm. or, and people like you do, or are we just underserving that community in your mind? So yes and, right? So there are many artists like me who um, have made a, a conscious effort for their work to be centered around justice and uh, community and creating spaces for people whose voices are not traditionally lifted, whose stories are not traditionally told. Right. Lots of us here in Charlotte, could there be more um, opportunities for us and more programming in those communities and things of that nature? Yes. And I, I also want to point out that those are conversations that artists like me and, and many others that I know have had with the Arts and Science Council and have been very well received. So, yes, um, there's always more opportunities, but I think... Also, I would ask a lot of our elected officials who are raising that sort of flag to, to come to some of the programming that we're doing. Mm. And Mike, I would also say it really was the input from Henna and other artists and from Commissioner Leek that informed our thinking and really helped shape the budget proposal that we brought forward. Because we, in that meeting, I talked with <laughs> Commissioner Leek about the progress we had made, in, in specifically in District 2, but acknowledged we agree we need to invest more. That's why when we broke out the county budget request, we put in specific allocations to expand the work that we're doing in neighborhoods also to deepen the support that we're providing to individual artists so as well. So let's talk a minute about what you do, because I'm, yeah. I'm not sure people are familiar with what you and what people like you do. I am familiar, because I, I, I emcee the South Carolina uh, Arts Commission's uh, showcase yeah. for all these arts organizations scattered throughout South Carolina, several years running I did mm -hmm. this, and there were lots and lots of storytellers yeah. who came onto the stage at the, at the Dock Street Theater in Charleston and, and aud essentially auditioned. Yeah. And the stories were amazing, mm -hmm. riveting, breathtaking. That's what you do. And I don't think that most people think of that as something that's an arts endeavor. Yeah. It's storytelling. Yeah. It's the primal form 
of us telling each other who we are, as, as, as Chip said. So what is the value of that? You're going into Enderly mm -hmm. Park, uh -huh. uh, and, you're, and you're doing a lot of things with them. Uh, what is the value of that in your mind? Yeah, so I go into Enderly Park. I, um, I get the stories about people's experiences with home, right? This is a community that has been hit pretty heavy where gentrification is concerned. But it's important to understand that these are real people, right, who live there, who work there, who love there, all of those things. I I get their stories from them, I then write them, and I work with storytellers from the community, spoken word artists, actors, um, volunteers. They learn those stories and share them on stage at packed standing room only events around Charlotte. So it's not just telling them back to the people at Enderly Park. No. It's, it's spreading the word. It is taking the stories of the people of Enderley Park and making sure that the greater city hears them, sees them, and understands why it's important to invest in communities like this. QCNerve.com described mm -hmm. you as telling the stories of people in Charlotte and giving life to voices that fall on deaf ears in mm -hmm. our city. Is that an accurate description of what you do, do you think? Yeah, I think so. It's a, it's, I feel grateful that I get to do that. Um, and I've seen, I was reflecting last night on um, a woman who came to one of the shows and came to me later and said that her and her spouse had just bought a home mm -hmm. and that they were planning to use it to flip and just make money off of. And it was in a community like Enderley Park. But now they're going to keep it and re remodel it and make it affordable for someone. So when we talk about stuff like affordable housing, in this city, there are creative ways to think about how we can create community for everyone. And we're doing that through the arts. You're writing and telling stories, mm -hmm. I'm told, about housing and homelessness and gentrification, even law enforcement and mm -hmm. the community's intersection with law enforcement. And you say Charlotte is this pot that's on the stove mm -hmm. and it's boiling. Are you telling stories of what's in the pot and the various people in the pot or why it's boiling and what that means. Yeah, all of that. Okay. Uh, the pot, the stove, <laughs> what's in, in the pot and everything. I think the beautiful thing about storytelling is you're able, well, I am able to, um, I have the ability to look at things from a very objective point of view. And I go into communities and I hear from from all of the different people and, and the different stakeholders. I don't want just one side of things, right? I then present those on stage, and then the audience can do with it what they will. Mm -hmm. How many organizations, how many uh, artists, individuals uh, like Hannah does the ASC support? How many do you know that are out there that need your support that you can't afford to support, that you'd like to support? How, how, what, what's the number? Yeah. It, over the past six months, there are 100 artists that have benefited in either in a direct grant from Arts and Science Council or who have benefited by participating as a provider in our Culture Blocks program, or we haven't yet talked about the school funding opportunities we provide, but we match artists and organizations with schools to provide cultural opportunities uh, for students. Uh, so while that represents progress, I talked about the fact that that number would have been much lower just uh, several years ago. We heard loud and clear throughout the fall uh, that we need to, we need to do more. Um, you know, uh, music is, uh, uh, is certainly enriches people's lives and it, change, it rewires your brain, it makes you feel good, uh, dance can, do, can tell stories, but not, nothing is more effective in telling stories than the spoken word, whether mm -hmm. it's from a storyteller or through a, a play or some theater piece. Uh, you found a way, Hannah, to talk about social justice mm -hmm. to audiences that may not be aware of some of the things that you're talking about mm -hmm. through your storytelling. It's something theater has done, but also it seems to me theater in this city, at least historically, has sometimes gotten pushback for telling stories that people don't want to hear. Are Charlotteans receptive to what you're trying to do and some of the things that you'd like to produce at Actors Theater? That maybe you don't. I think our audiences definitely are, and I think there's a, a, a hunger to have those conversations. The um, art, theater especially, it's the, we have to have the conversations, and the conversations are uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. um, but to try to silence those voices, I mean, that's, you, you can't do that to any art. All art is political, and it has a voice, and it wants to be heard and seen whether you like it or not. The thing about it is, is it inspire conversation. If it has the conversation, then we can work through our differences. So um, 
I believe the city has changed a lot since 96 and uh, when I first got here and, and that whole situation, I believe now the people are ready to have the conversations and they're ready to support the conversations. Uh, Hannah, you said you, 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 you put the work out there and you let audiences decide what they want to do with mm -hmm. it. You find them to be receptive to some of these uncomfortable, uh, some of these stories must be uncomfortable for yeah. those people. Do you find them to be receptive? Uh, absolutely. The, my audience is the last uh, Muddy Turtle Talks, which is the stories. Of Say it again. Muddy Turtle Talks. That's okay. the name of the storytelling <laughs> um, series in, in, from um, Enderly Park. The, the last event that I had, uh, the room was full of, it, at some point I had to stand back and, and really just let it like wave over me like what I was experiencing. People from all age groups, socioeconomic statuses, different religions, like it's very diverse and, and people are very accepting. We don't have a lot of time left, about two minutes, G. A city, we have, and you've alluded to this, uh, so I'll bring it up. City Council funding would allow you to provide about $400,000 for arts and culture programs in the schools. Uh, and I'm not sure how many people realize that. Are you providing those programs now? What would, what would be the impact if you had to stop, or are you just planning to increase the amount of programming? The proposal f uh, in front of the Mecklenburg County Commission is to increase funding for that program. We're currently working with 150 schools uh, and a number of providers. We have a website and also an annual event where we bring teachers and representatives from schools together to see what's available from the cultural community to go into the classroom. Yeah. So we play really the role of matchmaker and funder in that process to help with uh, cultural experiences. Kirby emails, how can the a ASC restore or even create goodwill with the public when backers of the tax increase portrayed voters as being uninformed or not knowing what they were voting on when they rejected the tax hike. An employee of one of the arts groups in town even said that those who voted against the increase didn't appreciate, quote, nice things. I don't. I, I never saw an, uh, an occasion during the campaign where we were uh, 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 sort of making any kind of accusation that voters were uninformed. We had a constant concern about the fact that the, the ballot language was so obtuse. We spent a lot of time talking about the fact that the ballot language didn't describe what the investment would be for. I have about 40 seconds, and Ron has a great question to end this conversation on. If you could wave your magic wand to fix all of this, what would you do? I love that question. Yeah, you should have an answer for it. <laughs> I know I do. It, it, and, 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 and I think we start with the listeners of this program, but I think if every single person in Charlotte Mecklenburg wakes up in the morning thinking about how they make these experiences happen, you know, whether it's their personal involvement, buying a ticket, showing up, participating, donating, uh, we all have an opportunity to make the, com the community more vibrant. Jeep Bryant is president of the Arts and Science Council. Hannah Hassan is a local writer, spoken word artist, and benefits from the ASC. And Chip Decker is executive director of the Actors Theater of Charlotte. Thank you all for the hour.